Okay, so it's, it's our next panel discussion by Masters of Art in Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies students. We have Cameron Henderson, Amber Morgan, and Jay Wan Oh. And the title of this panel is You Are the Future, Nonproliferation and Disarmament Education. Hi, everyone. Oh, is it working? Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, we are all Masters of Nonproliferation students here at uh, the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. Um, we're very excited to be here with you today to hopefully shed some light on what it's like to be a young person um, studying in this field and studying at the school specifically in nonproliferation. Um, we've really enjoyed uh, watching some of your presentations. We were really impressed with everyone's work, so um, great job on that. Um, I think we're all going to introduce ourselves a little and then tell you a little bit about ourselves and how we found ourselves um, pursuing this career path um, and opportunities that you guys may be interested in as well. So we'll start with Jaywan. Hi, I'm Jaywan. Um, I probably took the most circuitous path into nonproliferation out of all of us. Um, I am a second semester student here but I definitely didn't know about nonproliferation as a field when I was in high school, so I'm very impressed with all of you for already coming so far and doing so much research into this. It's a very exciting field to be a part of. Um, in high school, I actually mostly knew that I was interested in languages and literature, um, so when I was applying for college, I was mostly thinking, okay, like maybe I'll do like a double major in English and French, and then we'll see where it goes from there. I was thinking that I probably wanted to work as an editor in a publishing house, um, but then I actually did some research, found out how competitive that was, and was like, okay, I'm going to major in international politics. And for me, it like wasn't even because I like had a particular passion for international politics. It really just came from a place of, I think that like, since I like languages and politics is probably more employable, like this makes more sense. Um, but then I went to Middlebury for undergrad, and um, while I was there and I took an international politics course, my favorite unit in that class was on um, WMD, nonproliferation, and it really fascinated me because it got me thinking about a lot of bigger picture issues and I started to think, okay, um, there's actually a lot to do in this field and this has a lot of huge implications even for people who are not working in this field. So then I thought about that and actually almost applied to this program straight out of college, but then decided not to. Um, I wanted to work first and then actually went in a whole bunch of different directions. I first um, went on the mission field, then I started teaching, then I actually did go back and like work in children's publishing at Scholastic in New York, which was actually my dream job, and I had a lot of fun and really, really liked it. Um, but for me, like I really didn't think about nonproliferation again until the fall of 2017, which as our previous presenters mentioned, is when North Korea um, successfully tested their first intercontinental ballistic missile. So I'm a Korean American and I had grown up hearing a lot of stuff about um, North Korea from my family. My family is South Korean, but my dad um, was working for the government before he moved to the US and it was something that he was very passionate about and continued to talk about a lot. So because of all of that, when all of this started happening and especially um, with all the rhetoric around it in the US really heating up, then I started to wonder, okay, so I really like publishing, but what really attracted me to nonproliferation in the first place is how much of an impact you can have doing things that really matter on a grander scale. And you know, as a Korean American right now, is there more I could be doing in nonproliferation than if I just continue to have fun in children's publishing, even though I really do love children's publishing and I see a lot of value in that field as well. So that's when I started applying again to this program. Um, I got in and then, uh, as you may or may not realize later, if you start applying for grad school, grad school is super expensive. So um, I was also looking into it and realized, wow, like I got in, but if I go to grad school, I'm gonna, this is gonna be impossible to pay for. So then I also started to research um, different scholarships and fellowships that I could possibly apply for and ended up applying for and getting the Pickering Fellowship, which is funded by the United States Department of State. Um, and basically, they're funding my education, and in exchange, I'll be working in the Foreign Service when I graduate. So at this point now, um, I pivoted a little bit. In college, I was focusing more on Western Europe um, with international politics, and now I'm studying Russian and um, starting to actually study um, Russian politics more, which is also a lot of fun. Um, and I'm hoping to work in Eastern Europe as a Foreign Service officer when I graduate. So that's kind of how I got here. And then once I got here, I jumped right into all the nuclear nonproliferation stuff. Um, did not, again, as I said, have a lot of background in nonproliferation specifically. I had background in international politics. Um, 
the last semester, I um, took the a course we have here called the Non-Proliferation Treaty Simulation Course, NPT Sim, and um, that was like a really fun class where we all got to um, represent different countries and two different working groups, and actually, you know, try to negotiate different aspects of um, the NPT conferences. So in our case, we were simulating the PrepCom that will be happening next month in New York. Um, I was representing France in working group two, um, focusing on non-proliferation and peaceful uses. We kind of combined those into one group. Um, so that was a lot of fun, and it, it was a, also like a really huge entry point to start learning about all the different issues related to non-proliferation. It was a really good introduction to all of that. And then also, I started working pretty immediately at the Center for Non-Proliferation Studies here. Um, what I do there is mo mostly focusing on um, nuclear and radiological materials that fall outside of regulatory control. So I work on the Trafficking and Nuclear Incidents Report. Um, so that's all the stuff I've been doing since I've been here. And I will be attending the NPT PrepCom next month and also speaking at a side event on US and Russian relations and how to improve cooperation um, in the future. So that's what I've been doing up to this point. Happy to take any questions later if you have them. Thank you, Jaywon. Um, Cameron, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, hello, my name is Cameron Henderson. I am from the middle of nowhere in the state of Georgia. And um, my interest in nonproliferation has really stemmed from the same age that all of you are. Um, from my very first debate topic when I was a freshman in high school, we were debating the tenets of withdrawing military, like US military presence abroad, specifically in South Korea and Japan, and then associated proliferation risks um, with that withdrawal. So, um, oops, sorry. So I can say that like I thought I was the smartest freshman because I understood what mutually assured destruction was. Um, and I, now, obviously, reflecting on that, I don't think I really had a full comprehensive understanding of mutually assured destruction at the time. Um, but I highly encourage all of you, if you have access to something like a debate program, to participate in that. Um, just watching all of you here today and seeing some of your presentations is very reminiscent of my time in debate, which I actually did continue into college, where um, I went to the University of Georgia, and I debated there for a number of years. And I also coached debate at the Marist School in Atlanta. Um, so I think that using resources like that is really useful in getting, um, you know, furthering your interest in the field of nonproliferation and understanding sort of the practical applications um, of policymaking in this field. Um, at the University of Georgia, I had the amazing opportunity of working at the Center for International Trade and Security for a year, and then continuing doing research on the Nonproliferation Treaty, actually, um, even after I, continue, after I finished that fellowship. And during that fellowship, I got the opportunity to work at a state, uh, Department of State-sponsored academy, training um, compliance officers in export controls and regulations, which... Um, since attending the Middlebury Institute here, um, I work as a graduate research assistant at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, where my work focuses predominantly on export controls and on emerging technologies, which I think is a really interesting nexus between sort of the private sphere and the public sphere, where um, you know, you see that there are a lot of advancements in technology that maybe are outpacing the rate at which we are prepared to deal with those things. Um, so my work here has been focusing on 3D printing specifically and the implications for aerospace and nuclear industries um, with that. And one thing that we had been discussing also as part of this panel um, when we were preparing for it was, you know, it, there are a lot of things that you can do to get engaged in this field, even if you feel like you don't always have resources that are available to you, because um, A, you can come to events like this, which you know are awesome and you travel and um, they're very useful, but also there's a lot of times there are resources in your hometown that you maybe didn't think that were available or necessarily were related to nonproliferation. And so I'm from a military town, so I grew up in an Air Force base. like. If you're not really from my town, if you haven't been stuck in traffic because there was an F-21 um, or F-15 on the on the highway. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of 
different resources that you can use that are, are local that maybe you didn't think were related to the field. Like I didn't think that I would be spending a lot of the time that I am now researching things in the aerospace industry because that's not something that I felt like I had a technical background in. Um, but it turns out like I did have more of a background in that than I realized. Um, another thing that I would say led me here was um, while I was at the Center for International Trade and Security, a representative from Middlebury came and talked to us and encouraged us to, jo to join this program. And that led me to um, apply for and get an internship at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies as an undergraduate, um, which was immensely useful. Um, not only did I get to sort of apply what I had been learning and thinking about doing in debate, um, very, really hands-on um, through working for um, different various people at the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, um, but also we got really useful lectures and all, and a, a, a number of these um, issues from people who are like the experts in their field. And that internship really showed me the different uh, the different pathways and the different job opportunities that do exist in this field. And it was much larger than I realized it was um, to begin with. Um, since I've been here, I also participated in the same uh, nonproliferation treaty simulation that Jaywan participated in. And I was the chair of working group one. So I got the opportunity to moderate the discussion. And um, interestingly enough, the last presentation that was just given about the INF um, in returning to returning to treaties, um, it actually, at the end of our simulation, it was interesting that we were able to get both Russia and the United States to agree that the INF was a good treaty, was being the operative word, um, but they still like acknowledged that it had a, you know, a positive impact on their relationship. So um, I also am getting the opportunity to go to the NPT PrepCom in uh, New York City next month. And I am also going to be speaking <laughs> at the um, sort of side dialogue between U.S. and um, Russian rising experts. And um, so, I don't know, there are, there's a lot to do in the field, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions about different pathways to, to get here. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Cameron. Um, so I'm Amber. Um, I also went to the University of Georgia for my undergraduate education. Um, I didn't know Cameron while I was at the University of Georgia, um, but we did go through the same program just in different years. It was an amazing opportunity um, as an undergraduate to get to learn about these kinds of things. Uh, I think all of you guys have a head start on these issues because you're in high school and I was not thinking about these things in high school. Um, but I was introduced to them once I got to the University of Georgia, and I um, really enjoyed um, my undergraduate program so much that I decided to pursue my master's here um, in nonproliferation. Um, since, so I guess I'll start with um, most of my background um, in this field is illicit trafficking and export controls, kind of similar to Cameron. Um, I started at the Center for International Trade and Security. Um, I then worked on these issues at the Belfer Center, which I heard um, referenced in a presentation earlier. Um, and then I came here um, to the Center for Nonproliferation Studies, where I also work on illicit trafficking um, and export control issues. Um, I had the opportunity last summer to work at the U.S. Mission to International Organizations in Vienna, um, which is where the International Atomic Energy Agency is, as well as the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization. Um, I got a chance to go through some of your presentations, um, so I know a lot of you have learned about those organizations. Um, I worked at the, the U.S. mission there, um, so I was really able to work with U.S. diplomats um, interacting on these issues on the multilateral level with Russia, with China, uh, France, the U.K., and everyone else. Um, and it was a really good opportunity for me to put into practice my education that I've gained here at the Middlebury Institute um, to apply my knowledge in practice um, and learn how these things kind of operate in the real world because most of my background was in research. Um, so then I had the opportunity to apply it in practice. Um, I had a really great um, experience working there. I got to attend the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization um, Preparatory commit, uh, Committee. Um, which was a really great learning opportunity for me. Um, I think, as you all know now, because you've done so much background research, um, the U.S. ratification, the U.S. has not ratified the CTBT, um, and that lends itself to some political diplomatic um, problems when it comes to dealing 
uh, in multilateral settings with these issues. Um, but everyone is trying to move forward the best they can um, in light of the reality of things. Um, I also got to um, intern at the International Atomic Energy Agency, um, where I learned a little more about nuclear safeguards. Um, and it was another chance for me to apply and practice um, what I've learned here at the Middlebury Institute. Um, one thing I will say is I know everyone of you here isn't going to go on to study international affairs or political science. Um, everyone here is going to pursue different paths, but there are multiple paths into the field um, as a young person. Um, there are a lot of nuclear engineers, a lot of physicists, a lot of chemists um, that contribute a lot to this field. And we actually have a few students here at the Middlebury Institute, I think, who have more technical backgrounds as well. So you don't just have to study international politics if, this, if you think that this isn't um, something that you're really interested in pursuing as your education. Um, uh, one more thing about me. Um, last year, I had the opportunity to visit Japan, um, and I got to tour a few nuclear facilities there. Um, but I also had the opportunity to uh, visit the Hiroshima Memorial and um, to meet with a survivor of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. I think um, that really had an impact on um, how I viewed the field. Um, and really put a personal aspect on things uh, for me because I think so often experts in this field um, tend to talk about strategic stability and mutually assured destruction and nuclear deterrence, um, but really there's a very human aspect to the consequences of uh, these weapons that we study. Um, I was very excited to see um, in one of uh, the presentations that you took the angle of empathy um, and education in, um, in addressing these issues, which I think is really important. And that was really something that I learned um, when I visited the Hiroshima Memorial. And it's really awesome, I think, to see more young people thinking about it in those terms, because the weapons that we study have very, very real consequences if, um, God forbid, they would ever be used again. Um, but that is something we have to think about and a consequence that we have to deal with and that we all have a responsibility um, to take very seriously. Um, another way that I think um, I've been able to get involved is through the Institute for Nuclear Materials Management Club here at MIS. I think J1 is also a member. I'm not sure if, I don't think Cameron is. Um, but it um, studies more the technical side of things, um, of the field, so nuclear engineering. Um, we are policy students here at the school, but um, we do study um, the engineering behind things, how the physics work. Um, I think all of you had to do a bit of background research on um, the technical side of things as well for this conference. Um, so it's a really good way to start to bridge the gap, I think, um, between the technical and policy communities because um, sometimes the nuclear engineers think they know best and sometimes the policy people think they know best. Um, so it's really um, something to think about as young people as you come into this field um, and that I think a lot of people already in this field could do better is to start to um, have better dialogue between the technical and policy communities. Um, I think that's all for me. Um, I also uh, was able to participate in the MPT uh, simulation, um, which Jaywan and Cameron have already touched on, so I won't go into more detail. Um, and I'll also be going to the MPT PrepCom next month, um, which I know we're all very excited about to participate in. Um, I think that's all for me. Um, we would really love to hear questions from you guys about um, pathways into this field, um, what it's like as a young person working in this field, um, and any other questions that you may have about Middlebury or Monterey or things like that. So thank you. have more sort of room, I suppose, for um, new participation. I can start and then I'll let you guys put in. Um, so I think um, because of the recent events with North Korea, I think, and Iran as well, a lot of people have been getting more interested in this field. It's been in the news a lot more. Um, I would be lying if I said that the policy side of this field is not very, very competitive. 
Um, there's a lot of people that are passionate about these issues and who want to work on these things um, from the policy side um, and getting jobs in the government or um, even in think tanks and things like that. Um, it's difficult and it's competitive because there are a lot of good people who want to work on these issues. Um, I think I've had the opportunity to interact with engineers a little bit and um, I think coming from the technical side of things, um, it sometimes may be easier to enter this field um, if you're a nuclear engineer or a nuclear physicist or a chemist or something of that sort um, because there there is a need for more technical people in the field, um, especially in the field of safeguards. I know the U.S. government is, um, the U.S. government in particular, I'm not sure about other countries, but um, they're having a hard time keeping people, uh, technical people in the safeguards realm. So um, there's a lot of initiatives to try to generate um, interest from young people in the safeguards, in the technical side of safeguards. Um, so I think coming into it um, from a technical side is a bit easier, um, but I also have uh, a few friends who did their bachelor's degrees in like nuclear engineering and now they're getting their master's in policy. So they're able to combine the two and um, really add a lot of value um, in the field because they understand both. Um, yeah, I would second that. And I, so I definitely think that having a sort of more technical or more science background um, would at least make you stand out a little bit more because I feel like a lot of us come from the international affairs side of things. Um, but even on the international affairs side of stuff, it may not be the most flashy or for attractive thing, but I know Amber and I both have spent a lot of time working on export controls and export compliance. And um, as especially as new technologies are being developed and you know new companies are always entering um, whatever the industry is, so there's always going to be jobs in export export controls and export compliance. And that is one area that, not to say those jobs aren't competitive, but there are definitely a lot of growing jobs, especially in the tech sectors where any company that wants to then do business with foreign entities um, for whatever it is they, that they're producing, even if it's not inherently dual use, would require someone on staff to be there to make sure that they're not doing any illegal activity or having any illicit trade. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, considering that with issues like a non-proliferation non and um, issues that involve like weapons that can har harm large amounts of people, how do you find ways to humanize the situation for those who don't have opportunities to visit Hiroshima or um, humanize them in general when you are talking about these issues to inspire people to participate? Yeah, I think that um, with humanizing any issue, um, and maybe non-proliferation specifically, the, one of the most powerful tools is having stories about individuals or specific experiences. Because um, for a lot of people, you know, when we read the news and we see like, you know, 300,000 people were killed, like it should matter, and it does, but it's also really hard to get a sense of that impact. But when you are able to put that into the perspective of a very specific story about a very specific individual, it really allows you to enter into that experience in a different way. And so I think that's why, you know, for example, even Amber sharing about her experience going is a way to put that into perspective for others. Like, you know, I haven't been able to go to Hiroshima, but hearing Amber's story helps me to think about that in a different way as well. So I think a lot of it really just comes down to being mindful of um, the individual experiences that people have and amplifying those whenever we can. Um, yes, I second what you said. Um, I think that's a really good question because it's something that this field struggles with, I think, because a lot of times nuclear weapons are seen as a source of power, of national prestige. Um, it's cool that we have nuclear weapons because it makes us powerful and it gives us influence. Um, so putting a human factor into that is very difficult sometimes. Um, yeah, like you said, sharing stories uh, that are personal, but also I think um, it's hard to reach the public with those things sometimes. So I think, um, I'm not sure if there have been efforts to um, do documentary series or something with survivors of Hiroshima. I think there have been a few. I'm not sure how many of them are in English, um, but I think that's something that's really powerful. I know I watched a documentary called Where the Wind Blew, 
um, last year about nuclear testing in Kazakhstan as well as in the US and the communities that it affected, the radiation that it left behind, the, um, the health problems that the local populations had. Um, and I think it was actually made from a director that's from Kazakhstan. Um, but that, even that documentary was really powerful to me because it, it showed and illustrated the human perspective of um, what happens when we use these weapons. Um, education and outreach, um, it sounds a lot more simple than it is to put in practice because it's difficult sometimes, um, but education, 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 I think, um, and documentaries and personal story sharing can be really powerful as well, I think. Yeah, I agree with all of that, and I would say that just having a dialogue between two people, even if you know I've not been to Hiroshima, I've not had that opportunity, but I can still talk to someone about the horrors of nuclear weapons and why I think that they shouldn't be used. And if that change, you know, it may not be on a large public scale, but I think that person to person communication on these issues will over time change a lot of um, public opinion. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have for it. Oh, I will also add, um, when I was in Hiroshima, something that really uh, struck me um, and was quite emotional for me was a lot of the children um, that survived the bombing had drawn pictures of what, like what they saw in their experience because they were children. They had a hard time, you know, expressing it with words and explaining. But the pictures were just horrible. I mean, it was like terrifying just imagining a seven-year-old remembering this and then painting it. Um, so they had a display of art, and I thought that that was very powerful for me, um, especially because it was coming from children. Um, so things like that are really powerful uh, to the public, I think. Thank you. Any more questions? I know that um, we talked about before the panel, we're really happy to share um, pathways into the field or like if what to major in an undergrad, what bachelor's degree to pursue, where to go to get your bachelor's degree. I know um, a lot of you, are, you all are in high school, so college is a really big um, daunting decision on everyone. So we're happy to share um, our experiences with that as well, if any of you would be interested. Yeah, I can definitely tackle that. Um, I was actually about to add that to the first question a little bit, because in addition to having the technical background and, and expert control specifically being a topic of interest, I was surprised at how much languages gave me an entry point into a lot of different opportunities in this field. Um, even for my job at CNS, um, I got it, I think, like my first or second day of orientation, and it really came um, because of like excitement about the languages that I knew and my writing skills and like writing background. Um, so I think that what really stands out for a lot of people in this field is that you know if you have all other candidates being equal, and there are a lot of them, right? A lot of highly um, qualified competitive candidates in a lot of different fields, then um, it really helps to have someone who speaks a language that is lesser known, um, it, or it helps to have someone speak a language very well. Um, and actually, I would even say from uh, my experience and from hearing the experiences of some other students, that even if you have a lesser known language and you don't speak it fluently, um, it still helps for you to be hired if you can speak it enough that you can use Google Translate with it, because that's still a difference between you and someone who doesn't know the language at all. Um, so I actually find that I've been surprised by how much um, employers and other people have seemed to value it. Yeah, I'll agree with that a lot um, and just add that as someone who doesn't have a strong language background, um, it even the little bit that I do have has proven very helpful and has come up in interviews and things like that. So people are definitely looking for it because it's something that makes you stand out. And like my Chinese is very poor, but I can still like read a couple documents and that is more than uh, someone who doesn't know any, any Chinese could do. And so that is something that could be immensely valuable, especially in the export controls where there's a lot of trade with China. So thank you. I'll also say, um, so I think we're all American, so we're kind of sharing our American experiences. But um, 
I have a lot of friends who go here who have had home languages because their parents were immigrants um, that were very rare, friends from Pakistan, whose parents were from Pakistan, India, um, China. Um, and so they spoke these languages um, at home. Sometimes they didn't have a very good academic control of them, um, but they're still very useful in the field because they can speak them like and do a little bit of research in them, um, even though they aren't academically, um, they weren't academically taught in this language. Um, so I, one of the wonderful things about America is we are um, a country of immigrants. So we have a lot of people here who have um, home languages that are hard to find sometimes um, in, in this field, like Korean, for example. Um, not a lot of people speak Korean, but um, that's something that's very helpful. So um, I know a lot of my friends struggled because they, um, they saw that as something that made them different growing up um, because they spoke a second language at home, but it's really valuable as you uh, grow up and start to enter this professional field specifically, I think. So judging from um, the process of non-proliferation, do you think that this um, uh, jobs related to um, non-proliferation will some, at some point go obsolete with the ban of uh, nuclear weapons if that was, were to be implemented at some point? Um, yeah, I think that's like one of the jokes that we have in this field is that our ultimate goal is unemployment because that means that we've done our job correctly. Um, but unfortunately, I think that that is a little ways off. So I, every time that North Korea launches a new missile or um, does something absurd, my dad messages me and it's like, oh, job security. Um, so, I don't know. I, th I feel like, yes, eventually, hopefully, um, but even in a world of zero nuclear weapons, there's still a lot of, um, I feel like there's still a lot of work to be done in verifying the, dis like the dismantling of that, like a lot of the work that um, the, IAE do the IAEA does specifically, I don't think would be like decommissioned just as a result of uh, disarmament. Yeah, I'll second that. Um, I will also say, um, even in the event that everyone decided to give up their nuclear weapons, um, you still have to verify that they're not rebuilding them. Um, you still have to check safeguards on nuclear facilities to make sure that they're being used for peaceful purposes. Um, so the IEA, I don't think, will go away. Um, things like the CTBTO to make sure that testing isn't happening. Um, so I think... Sure, I think sure the jobs would go down in number a bit, but there's still a lot of work that would have to be done because unfortunately there will always be bad actors. Um, so verifying and ensuring that um, countries really don't have nuclear weapons, hopefully we'll get to that point in our lifetime, um, is something that will still be important, I think. It's actually funny that you say that because I think for me, uh, the interest went the opposite way. I was interested in Russian as a language and then came into this field because I was like, okay, I guess this is useful in this field. Um, but I can t talk a lot about that actually and I try, I'll try not to go on too long because I actually only started learning Russian last summer. And um, for me, that was also my first experience learning anything about Russian culture or history or politics. So in a lot of ways, I felt very behind. And when I came in this fall, um, they placed me a lot higher than I had expected. And so my course in the fall was on Russian like economic and po political um, contemporary discourse. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I 
have less vocabulary in this than most people do because I haven't been learning it very long and I know nothing about like Russian history or culture and um, for a lot of other people in my class because they at least had background in one or the other they were able to follow along with a lot of it because you know you know we could be talking about something with a lot of unfamiliar vocabulary but they knew oh like this is about the cold war and this is about this specific context whereas for me it was like on both sides, I was just like, I don't know anything. <laughs> so I did a, a lot of different things, I think. Um, actually, one of my Russian classmates is here um, also. And <laughs> like one thing that I do a lot of is like we, um, like I speak with everyone that I can in Russian all the time, which my friends can also acknowledge. <laughs> um, and I actually, like I enjoy it a lot. So like I, um, like any of my friends from Russian school, always texting and everything is always in Russian. Um, I am also the kind of person because like now I have been studying more than a few languages. Um, whenever I'm learning a new one, I start trying to use it like literally all the time. So like as I'm like walking around my house and like figuring out like what I need to do or how to schedule my day, like I'll be talking to myself in Russian or like, and that's what I did in the previous languages I was learning as well. And those are all things that for me are really helpful. Uh, but I think with vocabulary and stuff like that, it's just a matter of more and more exposure. So that's, you know, looking at more documents at work. It's um, looking at like a lot of cartoons, honestly, because um, again, children's publishing, big interest of mine. So <laughs> lots of cartoons um, and just doing, basically trying to do as much full immersion as possible, even though I'm no longer in a full immersion environment. Um, actually, I had a dream in Russian during language school because <laughs> it like happened way sooner than for any other language because I was only doing Russian for eight weeks. And that was a weird experience for me because like usually I am interacting in more than one language all the time. But suddenly I was being really strict with myself and only doing Russian. And so it happened, I think, in maybe week two or something that I was there. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it's working, but it's also a little crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I will... J1 won't say this about herself, but she's very, very good at languages. She's, how many do you speak? Like five. So she's way ahead of most of us in the, on this, on uh, on the language front. But um, I think, so I, um, I learned Spanish here. Um, I started learning Spanish in my undergraduate education. And um, something for me that really helped, um, study abroad if you can in the language that you're learning. Um, my Spanish improved immensely in the three months that I was in Spain. Um, just by being forced to have to understand what's going on around you. Um, but also just TV shows have been very helpful to me. Um, I know a lot of people that aren't from the U.S. Um, when I meet them and they speak very good English, I'm like, wow, your English is so good. I thought you were American. And they're like, oh, I watched all these American TV shows when I was growing up, and that's why my English is so good. So I think TV um, is... Um, kind of fun to watch, but at the same time, you're learning the language. Um, so that's been a strategy of mine um, to help improve my language. Um, yeah, I also only started learning my language um, over the summer, so not too far into it. And I will say that just uh, keeping in contact with people that were in that class who also are no longer here, like in Monterey, um, is, has been very useful. Just we have like a group WeChat that we just all speak in Chinese when we can so that it is useful. And I do kind of similar to what Jaywan does where like if I'm walking around my house, I'll try to like narrate my actions in Chinese in my head just so like I can try to pick up vocabulary and um, sort of sustain what I what I do now. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you all for listening to us, and we hope that uh, we were able to provide some helpful advice. So, also good luck, and we're very glad that you're considering this field and are interested in it. So, and good job on your presentations. We were all very impressed. <laughs>